We are really excited to be coming to Bosch to be listening to so many amazing Girl Geeks tonight. We are very happy to host the Girl Geek Dinner as a celebration of gender diversity. And I'm very proud of the team here who has put all this together. How many of you came here looking for headphones, acoustic systems and our demos? <laughs> We're not that company. You may have gone outside and you may have seen our car, autonomous car, so I don't have to speak to our autonomous driving effort. Have you ever thought of how does the car know when to deploy this airbags? This is thanks to the airbags control unit in the car. It housed a tiny little sensors, which we call accelerometers. Did you guys know that at least every single one of you in this room, in your pockets or in your bags, have at least one sensor from Bosch on you? It's a fun fact. Each new generation of a battery management system looks to increase the charging speed of our device without having an effect on its lifetime. Each of these individual sectors provide us different opportunities to incorporate AI either as a feature of a product that we sell or as part of the process of producing that product. So our idea is asking human and machine to work together to empower their both abilities with much more perception and knowledge and also to make a better machine to help us in our everyday life. So how many of you are using ride hailing apps to get from A to B on a regular basis? Mobility is also getting more user-centric. The consumer is more and more changing from owned to shared. Big goals here, 2020. The goal is all of our electronic products will be connected. And in 2025, all our products are gonna either possess intelligence or AI will have played a key role in their creation. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Angie Chang, founder of Girl Geek X. Uh, we've been hosting Girl Geek dinners up and down from San Francisco to San Jose for the last 11 plus years. And we are really excited to be coming to Bosch to be listening to so many amazing Girl Geeks tonight. I got my own microphone. <laughs> You guys have no idea what that means. I'm Gretchen. Um, thank you. How many of you do your first Girl Geek dinner? Ooh, good. Okay. So like she said, we do them every week. We also have a podcast. So pull out your phone now and go to your favorite podcast app and then rate it and then write a review or send us a little message and say, this is how it could be better because we're only doing it. So it'll be awesome for you guys, right? Um, and then we also recently opened a little swag store on Zazzle. So there's all sorts of cute things. I only have one or two cute things tonight. Cute water bottle. I know, it's ridiculous. Oh, I kind of had stuff with, there are more designs than this one. Apparently I just only brought things. But it's a fanny pack. That's so cute. Okay, um, got it. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna try something new tonight. Who's found a job through Girl Geek? No one? Okay, get out. <laughs> okay, has anyone got a... Oh, you did. No, I oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, anyone found a job lead? Oh. Okay. I found You found candidates. Okay, so if you guys want to email us, I have these things and you can't buy them. You can only get it. Adorable socks. So if you want to tell us, we would love to feature your story about finding a Girl Geek, a job through a Girl Geek dinner, or something that you built, and we want to like have little community features and stuff. And if you do it, you get those socks, and it's the only way in the world to get the socks. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, how great is the space? This has been so awesome so far. You guys enjoying it? Yeah. All right, so without further ado, we are bringing this gentleman right here. Thank you very much, and welcome to Bosch. So my name is Hauke Schmidt. I'm the head of corporate technology research for Bosch here in North America, and I'm also the site leader for the Innovation Center here in Sunnyvale. A um, few words about the company for those of you who don't know Bosch all too well. We have our roots in the automotive business, so we're actually the largest automotive supplier in the world. And um, very likely, if you open your car, there are a couple of Bosch components inside. You also might know us from household appliances or power tools. 
Um, we're also a leading um, IoT company, as you saw in the videos here. And we're driving product and services innovation in the areas of mobility, um, industrial and, and building technologies. One interesting part about Bosch is the ownership structure. We are privately held. We're a very large multinational out of Germany and privately held. And um, mostly to the largest part owned by the Robert Bosch Foundation. And the foundation then also takes all of the profits and earnings we create and puts them to use in charitable projects. So this gives us an extra motivation to work hard and, and uh, provide good results. Um, the site here, we've been in Silicon Valley for 20 years now. We have our 20th anniversary this year. And um, we moved into this building one and a half years ago. So this is now our, our new home here with a nice Bosch sign outside as well. We have about 200 scientists, engineers, and experts on site. And these experts cover a broad variety of different functions of the company. We have here everything from corporate research, venture capital, technology scouting, prototyping, product development. But we also have product sales and engineering services here on site that we offer into the local industry around us. And um, we, um, for us, diversity is an important thing. We have um, associates here from a very broad variety of different ethnic backgrounds, also from experts in, in a large number of different technology fields. And um, so today we uh, are very happy to host the GERG D dinner as a celebration of gender diversity. And I'm very proud of uh, the team here who has put all this together. Uh, since I'm also the, the executive champion at the Women at Bosch group here on site as well. So, thank you. So with that, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Uma, who, will, who has her own microphone, Excellent. perfect, <laughs> <laughs> to kick off some of the uh, lightning talks that we'll uh, listen to right now. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, first, welcome from my side. My name is Uma Krishnamurthy, and I am a director here at Bosch uh, RTC. We are part of corporate, we, uh, me and my department, are part of corporate research of the bigger Bosch. Um, my particular groups are focused on microsensor systems technologies and multi-physics modeling and simulation um, areas of research. So today, let's see if this works. My role is very easy. It's going to be a bit longer than the others, but uh, my role is relatively easy. I'm going to be giving you an introduction to Bosch from a broader scale than what hopefully Hauke did. So, um, and then of course, I'm going to lead into the Internet of Things and how we play a role in there. This is a bit of a, hmm. Hauke unfortunately told you what we do. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask anyway, how many of you already were aware of what Bosch does and what our products are before you came to the dinner today? Oh, that's quite a few. OK. The reason I ask, how many of you came here looking for headphones, acoustic systems in our demos, <laughs> or you know, then solutions? Okay. We're not that company. Yep. We are Bosch. Um, who are we? First thing, we're very diverse. And uh, the range of products we cover is very broad. Um, I'm going to try to cover some of it today from the perspective of IoT. Um, I'll start off with this slide here, market figures. Bosch, exactly as Hauke mentioned, is, a, is from originally started by Robert Bosch in 1886, so we're over 130 years old. Yeah, we're pretty old. Um, we started in Germany, but um, as you can see, we're a global company. We have been in the Americas since 1906, I believe, so over 100 years old. Um, very, very long time, very well-established manufacturing company. We've made a very important, very, very um, huge reputation 
in creating high quality products. Um, 268 manufacturing sites across the world. Of course, we have a lot of uh, representation in Asia Pacific also. I wanted to draw your attention to that number right in the middle, 409,881 associates. Um, that's a huge number. Just to give you an idea, um, you take all of the associates at Alphabet, all of the associates at Apple, combine them, multiply by approximately two. Okay, you're all girl geeks, so approximately 1.78. <laughs> <laughs> And that'll be the number of associates at Bosch. This was, of course, from 2018. So we are huge, to give you an idea of scale. So what do we do? I'm going to try to answer that question with this slide. You may be aware of our products in the consumer goods business. You may have seen our dishwashers, washing machines, maybe some coffee makers, um, many household appliances, power tools. Um, very, very, um, very popular there and a leading supplier. We also work in energy and building technology. What is this? Here's a leading manufacturer of security communication technology. We actually make energy efficient heating products. This is a bigger business in um, Germany maybe than here. So we're very well known for that. Uh, or Europe, not Germany. Um, on top of that, Hauke already mentioned mobility solutions. 60% of our sales come from the mobility solutions business. This includes automotive and also consumer electronics, essentially things like sensors that go in your cell phones, smartwatches, things of that sort. We're a leading provider of that too. Surprising to me, I've been with Bosch for four years, so this was a bit of a surprise, industrial technology. We also make a, a variety of industrial technologies. What does this mean? If you've ever been to the Jelly Belly factory, <laughs> on the way back from Tahoe, you know, it's a good stop. So, if you stop there and look around, take a tour of the factory floor, you will see Bosch equipment, um, packaging equipment. I believe they might have been sorting the jelly beans, but I can't remember exactly. So, so we, we are pretty broad and you'll see us in many places, unexpected places. Um, that's how broad we are. To give you an idea of our culture, Hauke already mentioned our founder, Robert Bosch. We strongly follow the values of our founder, Robert Bosch, which comprises of quality and innovation, which is what our products are known for. And this may not be as well known over here in the US, but as known in, the, in uh, Germany for sure, is the aspect of social commitment. Robert Bosch himself gifted the Robert Bosch Hospital to the city of Stuttgart back in 1936, which stands to this day. And uh, a lot of very important medical research is done there. Um, including, I believe, um, uh, I, can't get, I can't remember all the details, but a variety of really good medical research is done there. And, and as um, Hauke mentioned, we're privately held. 90% of our shares are held by this Robert Bosch Foundation. And this foundation fundamentally finances work that addresses social challenges. So we, they focus on areas like healthcare, science, society, education, international relations, all about society and life. They have provided the numbers right there, 153-ish million euros to project grants that are in these areas. So they really put their money where their values stand. That's the message there. As I mentioned, one of the, one of the cornerstones of Bosch is our innovation. Um, we're worldwide, but we also have a very strong commitment to innovation. We have a, uh, I don't have the numbers here, a very large number of associates, I believe it was a 65,000 number uh, range of associates who work in R&D across the company. Some of those actually work under a separate division called corporate research, which we've alluded to in the past. And what you see in the background here is our campus that was recently built in Germany, specifically co for corporate research that services all of the Bosch um, groups, fundamentally, almost all of them. Um, and what you really need, I would like to highlight this one sentence over here, our objective. Our motto is invented for life, which is pretty much self-explanatory. So everything we do 
is about the quality of life, enhancing the quality of life through technology. Oh, I would like to say one more thing about this. Recently, I'll have to mind me if I refer to my notes, <laughs> only because our CEO uh, recently announced um, that we, Bosch, were going to be the first carbon neutral industrial enterprise from 2020. Wow. That is, <laughs> yep, yep. A huge statement, and we're all committed to delivering on that. So, what we came for, that was the introduction, very briefly. I'll try to go through this pretty fast. IoT at Bosch. Um, I'm, this is going to essentially be kicking off a series of uh, tech talks centered around IoT for Bosch. Um, I'm only going to set it up for them, and the real speakers will come after me. Um, so, what does IoT mean for Bosch? As many of you know, IoT is about creating better customer experiences through connectivity, right? What, and Bosch plays a very big role in it because we make a variety of products and we're connecting them to make our customers get a better experience out of it fundamentally. That's the simplest way you can think about it. In the process though, what we are noticing is industries are transforming. Um, and we are playing a key role in this transformation at Bosch. So how are we play, playing in this field? Just giving you a sampling over here. You may have gone outside and you may have seen our car, autonomous car. So I don't have to speak to our autonomous driving effort, our driver assistance efforts. There's many of those that are ongoing that are widely um, shared. But on top of our mobility efforts, we also work in the smart city area. We have products in all of these areas. So Connecting them and providing customer experiences goes beyond mobility into smart city, into buildings, industry, industry 4.0. But one of the key things for us, for our connected Bosch systems across these domains is we are creating intelligent, user-centric solutions without compromising safety or data security. Those are big messages that we carry and we essentially put into all our products. What is Bosch's IoT vision? Again, a borrowed slide. You will see um, big goals here. 2020, the goal is all of our electronic products will be connected. Okay, um, we're gonna continue working across a variety of domains and in 2025, all our products are gonna either possess intelligence or AI will have played a key role in their creation. So AI is closely tied to our IoT. A few examples, I'll have to go very quick. She just told me I have five minutes left. So. Okay, um, quick examples. Home appliances, Series 8 oven. It's an oven, yes, but it's also a microwave, it's also a steamer, and it's connected. So you can bake a cake if you have the right app. You can bake a cake in it from your phone, and I leave it there. <laughs> this app is apparently not available everywhere, but it's a, it is there, the technology is there. Um, mobility, we already mentioned that uh, powertrains is one of the big areas we, we contribute in for the automotive business. Electric powertrains is our big um, area of work now. One thing I'll show here is we're taking it beyond just electrification of cars. We're actually moving into other powertrain systems for um, other vehicles, such as two-wheelers and trucks. Another aspect here is beyond just building EV vehicles, we're also looking at connecting these vehicles. So anybody who has an EV vehicle cares about charging them. So we actually have an app, Bosch has an app, that'll let you find up to 20,000 charging stations which is uh, very convenient in five countries. And I believe that will be increasing as, we, as this gets more use, used more. Last but not least, uh, the example, automated valet parking. This came out recently. I had a beautiful video on this. It took too long. So I'll just tell you in two sentences. Uh, automated valet parking, it's like a mini autonomous vehicle that you can use in a parking garage. You bring your car to the garage, you walk out of it, hit the park button on your phone, the car will go park itself, 
when you're done with your dinner or whatever else, you come back to the garage, say, pick up the car, the car will drive itself to you, you can get in it and go home. That's the idea, and it's actually real, and we've already rolled it out. So that's an example of some of the innovation we contribute to. Okay, um, this, now I'll be talking to you about some of the elements of IoT, not for very long. <laughs> We have tech talks following me that'll go into all the details. So here, how does this, I'm gonna talk briefly about transformation from the things to IoT. I've already mentioned that we make a lot of things here at Bosch across many domains. But one of the fundamental things we do is in the hardware. Sensors is a big area for Bosch. We are one of the enablers. Sensors are the enablers for the Internet of Things and we're one of the leaders in building microsensors Bosch SensorTech, in fact, is the, the part of Bosch that builds them. And you'll be hearing a lot more about that from Tara right after me. Um, so sensors are the data collectors. So they are your direct connection to your products. They collect the states of your products, whatever they are. And then another aspect of it that is kind of hidden, but is very important, is batteries. So we need batteries to charge all of our things and our, our sensors and our phones, everything else. So that's another aspect that we, that, um, we will be talking about soon. Um, Yelena will be talking about it, I believe. So, so Bosch has a strong background in the hardware aspect of manufacturing and in sensors, products. So we understand that, the cause and effect. Um, that's our core business. So what else is there to be done in IoT? It's all about the connectivity. So once you have the data, you have to connect to it. So we have the data collectors. So the next thing you need is to analyze the data and to create some, um, once you acquire the data, you want to provide some, I guess, models, right? And some plans on essentially understanding the data and to potentially predict what's going to happen um, for whatever system you're working with. So that's where our AI comes into play. Right, and Lisa Marion will be talking about that. She's part of our BC Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence. Um, and then finally, it all comes down to the user and the user interface. So that portion will be handled, and it's an important portion, but that portion will be handled by Pan Pan and Shavnam will be talking about that. Um, they're part of our human machine interface, used to be called, but the interactions, human machine interaction group. So fundamentally, we are integrating our hardware with AI, our IoT products, and our sensors. And that's in a very, very high level picture of what Bosch does in IoT. I'm going to stop there and hand the microphone on to Tara. So Tara and Xiao Yan Yi will be talking about sensors next, and, uh, follow, and they will introduce the next speakers. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Tara Dolat and I'm part of Bosch SensorTech. Uh, I'm part of the team that focuses on consumer electronic sensors and uh, I'm an account manager, part of sales team. And hi everyone, my name is Xiao Yuan. If it's hard to pronounce, you can call me SY. Um, I'm the senior research engineer here in the corporate research. Um, I'm part of UMA's team. What I do is I make sensors and these sensors go to your car, your home and your phone. So I'll tell you more about it later. So did you guys know that at least every single one of you in this room, in your pockets or in your bags, have one sensor? And most likely, majority of you guys had at least one sensor from Bosch on you? It's a fun fact. Well, let me tell you that sensors are all around us. We might notice it, we might not, but these tiny, tiny little devices are actually pretty commonly used. They're made out of uh, micro electromechanical systems. They go also uh, uh, known as MEMS. These devices are made out of silicon. Silicon is the same exact material we use for semiconductor chips, and they are used for really complex circuits or switches that we use in our industry today. If you look at the picture to the right side over here, uh, this shows the structure of a MEMS, and you can see that within a thickness of a hairline, how many tiny little springs were able to fit in there. That's a MEMS structure for you. 
and typically these devices are within millimeters squared. So you can see that how um, detailed and small these structures are, and I find it personally very impressive. So how are these sensors made? The process starts with the silicon ingot that you can see on the left there, and then it is later cut into thin slices that we call the silicon wafers. So this is an example of the silicon wafers. By itself, it is not useful until we are able to process on it to make intricate features. We are able to do this thanks to our Bosch colleagues, Franz Lama and Andrea, because they invented the deep reactive ion etching, deep RIE, in 1996. It is now known as the Bosch process, because it has the ability to create a high aspect ratio profile in the silicon wafers. How high is a high aspect ratio and how tiny is tiny? Here's an example. That is that the width of these trenches is five micron wide and the height, the deep is 50 micron deep. So you can imagine how small all these features are. Accelerometers. We'll tell you later about it. It's an example of a type of sensors that we are able to create using this process. And Tara will tell you more about the sensors and other sensors, about extrameter and other sensors. So just as SY mentioned, we have a family of classical sensors known as motion sensors. We have magnetometers, accelerometers, gyroscope, the combination of two that would be an IMU, or you put all of the three together, it's known as nine degree of freedom uh, or absolute orientation. But why do we care about these sensors in general? What's the application or how do they improve our lives? Uh, well, the most classical approach was the use of sensors in automobiles. You guys might have heard about ABS, ESP, um, or even tire pressure monitoring system on the newer cars. These are uh, sensor applications. Without the sensors on your cars, you guys would not have these safety functionalities. Let me ask you this. If you had the choice between a sports car, a sedan, or SUV for safety of your family, which class of car would you guys probably pick? Okay, let me tell you, 20 years ago, that was not the concept. SUVs and safety were not two words used in the same sentence. Actually, these cars were known to be rolling over on the road and actually not safe at all. So what changed since then? The use of a gyroscope on the car is enabling them to stay stable on the road and not roll over. That makes them safe. And within 20 years or so, the market and perception has changed so much that all of you guys think SUV is the best choice to go with. That's the use of sensor. But also, the modern applications. Take autonomous driving. Everybody in the news is talking about it. Autonomous driving would have not been possible without sensors. Or even more commonly used applications like park assist, when you tell your car, please park it for me in this tight spot. That's using your sensors in the car or when you're trying to drive on the road and hopefully you guys are paying attention and not dismissing the traffic or texting, but no, more modern cars have this functionality that it actually tells you, please slow down, there's an object in front of you. Don't switch lane, there's an object next to you. These are the functionalities that modern cars have because of use of sensors in them. In addition to all the applications that Tara mentioned, there's one more application that should be familiar to all of you, which is the airbags deployment. In, from 1987 to 2018, more than 50,000 lives has been saved by airbags, according to the US Transportation Department of Transportation. Have you ever thought of how does the car know when to deploy these airbags? This is thanks to the airbags control unit in the car. And in this control unit, it housed a tiny little sensors, which we call accelerometers. When there is movement, like the impact in your car during the accident, this accelerometer are the sensors which can sense this tiny, this sudden impact. So let me show you the video of how it works. The accelerometer chip here contains of two parts. That's the circuit chip, and the MAM sensors. In the MAM sensors, you can see the blue part is the movable part, and the red part is the stationary part. 
when there is movement in your car, the blue part will move relative to the red part, and from there, it causes the relative capacitance change between these two parts. This capacitance change can then be sent to the airbag unit here, which will deploy the airbags. And for that, it will protect you. The sensing part itself takes around 15 to 30 milliseconds time to sense it, and the airbags will deploy from 60 to 80 milliseconds. So that's how fast it is that can deploy to protect you. So a more modern recent application for sensors are consumer electronics, specifically smartphones or tablets. Um, you guys have might noticed over the past few years that actually the cameras have improved quite a bit in terms of picture quality. I hate to take all the credit for the sensors, but they did play a part. You guys have might notice that when you're trying to take a picture, you're trying to zoom in, and historically, I was one of the people that would move the camera back and forth trying to get the best focal at and then making sure that my picture is not blurry. Well, today the cameras do that for you, and part of it is because of the image stabilization and the sensors that they use with the cameras. That's one of the applications that uses a sensor. But another more commonly used one, when you go from horizontal to vertical on your phone, uh, when you're looking at pictures and videos, this is something that probably most of us use every day. That's the use of a sensor on your phone. or. This one, I'm a personal huge fan, navigation. I'm always lost and somehow people trust me to put me in charge of direction. But the reality of it is, with my phone, if there is no magnetometer on it, I'm looking at the direction and I don't know if it says right, is it really my right or my left? But the magnetometer on my phone would be able to tell me where is the true north and at what point do I need to truly turn right or left? And that's a really helpful application for most of us that we probably use and don't commonly notice that it's a sensor on there. One other thing is, as you all know, that GPS hardly works inside the building. In the case of an emergency, especially in tall buildings, it is very critical for the emergency first responder to know exactly where you are. And this includes what floor you are in. The GPS do not give you this kind of information, but our Bosch pressure sensor comes to rescue. The, because of the, as you increase the elevation, the altitude, the air pressure decreases. And this tiny change of pressure can be sensed by our Bosch pressure sensors. So let me show you another video of how the pressure sensor works. Again, in the package, it has two chips, where there's the circuit chip and the MAM sensors. This time, the MAM sensors consist of a pressure-sensitive membrane, and on which there is four uh, resistors, which are connected in a Wheatstone bridge formation. As there's the pressure change, the shape of the membrane changes due to the pressure, and the resistance is changed due to the change of the membrane. This resistance change is measured as voltage changes, which range from one to five. And this voltage change correlates to the pressure, and this pressure will tell you which elevation you are in. And the information from this will be sent to the first responder, and they will come and rescue you. Just as SY mentioned, a uh, pressure sensor belongs to another family of sensors that are getting quite commonly adapted nowadays. They belong to environmental sensors. That includes temperature, humidity, gas, or a combination of all those uh, together as one single sensor. But how did they become so popular nowadays? Well, we are all health and awareness aware nowadays. I think most of you guys might be interested, but by show of hands, how many of you guys track how many steps you've taken or how many stairs have you climbed today? Majority of you. Well, I guess most of us has invested in either a fitness band or a smartwatch or look at it on, my, on our phones. When you go under health application, it tells you how many steps you've taken. That's an accelerometer on your phone or on your device. Or if you're interested in knowing how many climbs of stairs you've climbed today, well, that's a pressure sensor for you that gives that information. But it's not just about humans. So 
I recently heard about a cool application from one of our potential customers that they're trying to put the step tracking option on their chicken. <laughs> you would wonder why. But I guess when you go to these stores, you notice that there is like advertisement for eggs that are range free and organic. That extra dollar amount that they're charging is justified because these chickens are taking more steps. The more steps they take, the healthier your chicken. <laughs> but today, we're here for IoT. And how does this sensor relate to IoT? How does that impact me as an individual? How does it change the quality of my life? Uh, I can take the example of a smart home. This belongs to the IoT category. Without the use of all these sensors, smart homes would not be possible. Let's focus on my case specifically, and I think some of you guys might relate. I'm here with you in the evening or the afternoon today. I will spend some time to drive home, and during this drive, I would be probably sitting in traffic. It's hot, and I'm thinking, I wish when I get home that my Roomba has cleaned the floor, so IoT would be able to enable that. I wish that the AC has been running for the past 30 minutes, because I'm somewhat environmental friendly, but not extremely. I, I still like a cool room. So I'll take that, and I can make sure that a cup of coffee is waiting for me while I watch my last show before I go to bed. That's a smart home for you. For IoT to be enabled, we need to make sure that all these sensors are effectively and efficiently communicating. But then it becomes a matter of power consumption. And that's why Yelena would introduce battery management, which is a really important topic here at Bosch for us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yelena Gorlin, and I work in corporate research. As Tara and Seyuan just mentioned, we will now switch topics, and I will introduce a research topic that we have here at Bosch it focuses on batteries and specifically battery management systems. Before going into the details of the topic, I wanted to take a moment and quickly introduce to you my home department in order to give you an idea what type of associates are working on the project and also what is uh, our overarching purpose for the everyday work that we do. My home department and Bosch is called Energy Technologies and we have three areas of research competency and they include electrochemical, modeling, characterization and controls, automistic computation, and additive manufacturing. As you can imagine, the associates uh, involved in these areas come from a diverse research background, and we actually have research experience from leading academic institutions, both in the US and Germany. We're specifically strong in the areas of chemical engineering, system controls, material science, and electrochemistry. And what unites us all is our interest to work on future energy technologies with the goal of reducing the global carbon footprint. And recently we came up with a new motto for ourselves and it's putting low carbon options on the global energy menu. <laughs> our department sees the topic of battery management systems both as a contributor to decarbonization of our society and also as an enabler to our connected future. But you're probably now wondering what exactly is a battery management system and how can it be so important to our future? So as the name already gives it away, and as I mentioned in the beginning, battery management systems have to do with batteries. And probably all of us in this room have been in a situation that seemed quite dire simply because our phone or maybe our smartwatch, our computer or our car has run out of its battery. And in such, such a situation, we were probably wishing that we could recharge our battery as quickly as possible to bring the device back to life. Well, it turns out it's not so difficult to recharge a battery very fast once in its life. But what is difficult is to be able to offer consistent fast charging without introducing any aging effects. And as you probably have guessed, one of the important functions of the battery management system is to offer precisely this capability. A battery management system, or as we call it BMS for short, controls the operation of the battery, so how fast it charges and discharges. And each new generation of a battery management system 
looks to increase the charging speed of our device without having effect on its lifetime. And you can imagine that advances in this area can reduce our anxiety about you know, how long our devices can last and as a result contribute to electrification of our society both in IoT and mobility sector and contribute to its decarbonization. So now I hope I was able to convince you that battery management systems are very important and very significant to our future. And I wanted to take a step back again and bring you to my department and our approach to this future product. At its core, our approach draws on the expertise available within the department. And we rely on the different areas uh, of background, especially in research. As I mentioned, we have chemical engineers, we have control engineers, we have material scientists and electrochemists, and we primarily combine three areas, and it's electrochemical modeling, experimental characterization, and controls. Our typical project workflow starts with the development of an electrochemical model. It involves a variety of equations and parameters. We then design and execute experiments to measure these specific parameters and combine them together with a model to form what is known as parameterized model. This parameterized model serves as the basis for the next generation BMS and is used to generate new control algorithms. And these control algorithms are what is gonna allow us to charge our devices, so our watches, our phones, our computers, and our cars at faster speeds and therefore increase our confidence in all of these uh, IoT uh, components and contribute to the development of our connected future. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will now pass the mic to Lisa Marion, who will tell you about artificial intelligence. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lisa Marion. I work at the Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence here in Sunnyvale. So we have a lot of opportunities for AI at Bosch. Um, as my previous colleagues have mentioned, we cover a wide variety of different sectors from mobility, industrial, building, and consumer goods. Each of these individual sectors provide us different opportunities to incorporate AI either as a feature of a product that we sell or as part of the process of producing that product. And as Uma had mentioned before, that is a major goal for Bosch to by 2025 <laughs> have all our projects, products either possess um, some artificial intelligence as part of their features uh, that we provide to the consumers or as we produce them, we are using AI. So what we need to introduce AI into our products or our processes is what gets discussed mostly um, when people are talking about artificial intelligence tends to be focused on the algorithms more. Um, so it's basically how you actually train um, a system to be able to learn by itself, um, how a car can drive itself, for example. Uh, and we do work on that in-house as well. The Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence has a um, pretty sizable research team that is currently working on state-of-the-art research topics. Um, but additionally, to actually get it from an idea, from a theoretical idea into a product, we need both compute resources, uh, which we, of course, have access to, and most importantly, we need data. Um, so one of the advantages that being such a large company gives us, especially a company that covers so many different sectors, is that we have access to a bunch of different um, types of data. Um, so BCAI overview, I guess. Um, our general mission is to help reach that goal, obviously, of introducing AI into the different areas. Um, I already covered our research team. We also have an enabling team, which are, you can kind of think of them as uh, AI evangelists. They go out to the different business units and kind of teach them about you know, what machine learning is, how it can help in their products, um, what kind of data they need to be collecting if they want to be able to gain relevant insights from it. And then we have the services team, which is where I work. 
uh, we focus more on applied AI. So what we do is we consult with various business units uh, within Bosch who have use cases or are interested in introducing machine learning into their products or processes, and we basically help them take that from an idea to a reality. Uh, we cover these four different areas. I'm gonna briefly describe kind of each one. Uh, we have a bunch of different projects ongoing right now. Um, but for an example, in the manufacturing domain, something that we do is we work with uh, optical inspection, which is where we put a camera in the uh, production line at Bosch's many plants. And we basically collect images of the parts as they come through and try to perform or try to train, train a model to do automated part inspection. So basically being able to tell if a part is passing or failing by just looking at an image of it. Um, in the engineering space, uh, we, do, we do some work around um, gaining insights from data that is collected as we develop a new sensor, for example, for a new product, or if we are trying to add kind of a smart home type of functionality to an existing appliance that Bosch already makes. Uh, for supply chain management and controlling, uh, we have a financial forecasting platform that basically looks at all of Bosch's financial data and can make predictions about future sales. And then intelligence services, which I'm going to go into slightly more detail on, um, since that is more of what I have worked on recently. So um, AI for mobility is obviously a hot topic. We have um, two main groups at Bosch that are working on that. We have, um, for my friends that work in the autonomous driving space, um, you may be familiar with the um, L3 to L5 kind of designations. So we have um, driver assistance functions, which are going to be your L3 and below. Those are things like automated braking when you detect a hazard on the road or lane keeping, kind of those functionalities that already exist in your car. And we also have autonomous driving group, um, which is the car outside, which would be the car driving itself. Um, some collaborations that this group has done uh, with BCAI that I've been involved with have been uh, lane keeping. So if you see the top image, um, we basically take a semantic segmentation map of a, of a scene and basically use that um, to keep the car on the road. Um, we also do hazard detection. So if you look at these two images in the middle, the one on the left is a mostly clear windshield. The one on the right, the windshield has been obscured with some droplets of water. A human looking at these two images can clearly tell that they're the same scene. Um, we basically, our brains have a really good way of mentally deleting the information that you don't need. It's very difficult for a computer to do the same thing. That's one of the main challenges when we're training um, algorithms to be able to see, for example, for driving a car. So we've done some work around um, helping either make the model itself more robust to these kinds of disturbances, or basically just having some kind of a sense so that the car knows when one or more of the cameras has been, had its vision obscured. Um, and then the last topic, which I wanted to cover in slightly more detail, is the data privacy compliance topic. Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the GDPR regulation. Yes, okay, a lot of nodding. Yeah, so that's a, a really important law that was passed by the EU, um, which basically, the, the general gist of it is that uh, any company that is collecting personally identifiable information from people without, um, their consent basically needs to delete that data every six months or somehow you scrub the personally identifiable information. For our automotive topics, that mainly covers human faces and license plates. So what we did to help our business units and prevent them from throwing away their data every six months is we developed a tool using deep learning to be able to identify, locate the faces and license plates in the data that was generated by the proprietary Bosch sensors and blur those out of the image. So basically what we are doing is helping them generate training data that they can use long term and also store, uh, which will help them basically consistently validate their work over time. Um, so yeah, just AI for your AI. <laughs> Uh, so that's kind of the overview of what uh, Bosch is doing in regards to AI. I've kind of mostly talked about how we spread AI internally, and now I'm going to bring the user back into the conversation and pass off to my colleagues uh, to talk about human-machine collaboration. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Shabnam. I'm a research scientist here at Bosch working in human-machine interaction group, and I'm very excited to be here with my colleague, Pampan Tundrasudis, our group too. 
Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Pan Pan. I'm also uh, working on the human machine collaboration topic at Bosch Research. So today, Shabnam will first give an introduction of uh, what uh, about what are the topics we have been working on, and uh, yeah, she will start. Uh, so uh, the topic we are really excited to work here at Bosch is human-machine collaboration. If you think about everyday life, there are so many tasks that human is so good at, but machine usually has so much trouble doing them. And also there are so many tasks, let's say repetitive tasks, that machine might be so good at doing them very accurately, but human would be having so much trouble to perform them in a short amount of time. So our idea is asking human and machine to work together to empower their both both abilities to make a superhuman with much more perception and knowledge and also to make a better machine to help us in our everyday life. Uh, so here at Bosch, we do focus on many core technologies such as robotic manipulation, text mining, uh, audio analytics, and visualization. And we do apply these technologies to so many different use cases such as IoT, Industry 4.0, smart home, and smart cars. Uh, how we do, uh, so here first I'm going to introduce you how AI can help humans. So our goal is empowering human capabilities. What we do in our group is that we take different modalities that we see in the environment such as visual clues, text, and audio and speech that we hear around ourselves. And we combine this information with domain knowledge, context knowledge, and user knowledge. And we translate them to some specific applications, such as personal assistance, conversational AI, and augmented reality. As I mentioned, our, uh, our goal is empowering human with domain-specific AI. Here, I focus on one of the uh, one of the use cases we work that I focus on personally, which is intelligent audio analytics. If you think, of course, the speech is one of the main. Okay. No, it's okay. We can continue hearing that. It's fine. <laughs> Okay, what I wanted to say was that <laughs> if you think about speech, of course, it's one of the main uh, input and the way of communicating with outside world as a human, right? But there are so many other sounds that we can hear in the environment, such as the sample of sounds you just heard, right? By these sounds, you can guess kind of what kind of environment you were at, where you at a beach or where you at a restaurant, right? Just by listening to the noise in that environment. Or you can guess what kind of machine are you are operating. Is that machine is uh, working in a, in a right mode or is it broken, right? Uh, so here in our uh, group, we focus on signal processing and machine learning techniques to discover three kind of sounds. The first one is environmental sounds, as you heard, is it beach? Is it in the office? Is it in the restaurant? The second one would be machine sounds, right? We hear, we listen to the different machines in the environment and we try to recognize if they are malfunctioning or they are working in the right state. And finally, human sound, but non-speech human sound. Imagine you might be coughing or sneezing and that might be a clue that you might have some health issues and you might want to go to a doctor, right? Uh, so the audio analytics field is um, kind of newer compared to vision or speech technology that already exists. So we have so many challenges uh, at this field, and the main one would be uh, lack of data, as always exists in artificial intelligence. And also, we need to be really robust um, toward the, the other uh, different kind of noise and environments that we are at. Uh, so here's some of the use cases we work on. Uh, the first one, we can focus on physical security and automation. You think uh, that in most places, the physical security systems are based on cameras, but there might be so many situations cameras might fail. Let's say if it's dark at night or if it's foggy, so the camera might not see uh, what's happening in the environment. But also there are some events that camera is visual clues are not able to capture them. Let's say gunshot, right? Uh, with a camera, if the gunshot is not in the like visual field, you can't uh, basically capture that. So, 
Our idea is including microphone to a camera to understand more information about our environments. In this case, such as gunshot, glass break, and a smoke alarm can be sounds that can um, alarm our physical security system. The next use case is Industry 4.0. As I mentioned, we would like to put microphone in our plants and listen to the machines that are working on those plants. And for this, this is a very easy step to move toward Industry 4.0, since the only thing we need to do is basically we put a MEMS microphone on these devices and just listen to them to see if they're operating correctly or not. And the third one would be automotive sensing and diagnosis. Uh, of course, autonomous cars, um, they are hot topics these days, and uh, they, are in, um, uh, they are having so many sensors already on them, such as, let's say, radar, camera. But we believe that autonomous cars need to have the hearing sense as well. Uh, one of the important use cases would be, for example, hearing emergency vehicles. If there is siren happening, for example, police car or ambulance, so these autonomous cars need to understand these sounds and act accordingly. And another use case uh, can be listening to your car parts. For example, your car engine. If you go to repair shop, so many of the very experience like repair uh, shops, they just listen to your engine and they would guess if you have a problem. So this is our idea to do that automatically. And finally, to give you some idea uh, how we perform these acts, so basically we do use microphones to get this raw audio input from the environment. And this information, we do some signal processing to enhance this signal to remove some environmental noise that we don't want them. And we do use domain knowledge, meaning that we do look into what kind of environment we are performing. Are we in a factory? Are we in a house? Are we in a car? And based on that, uh, we extract some features. And finally, we do machine learning and AI to detect what kind of audio events was in the environment. Next, my colleague Pam Pan, she will explain now how human can help AI. Um, so uh, here comes the other side of story. How can human help make AI more intelligent and more uh, reasonable to the humans? So um, our approach is actually a very uh, much human in the loop uh, method for big data analysis, which we call visual analytics. So uh, visual analytics is uh, actually a technique which combines um, technologies from many different fields, and one of these fields is uh, data mining. And with data mining, we basically uh, trying to gain insights from data with automatic algorithms and identify the patterns inside it. And uh, uh, the other technique is visualization. Basically, uh, we can draw the uh, charts to show different trends and patterns detected by the data mining algorithms, and then show or present to the users. And the most important part is uh, user interaction. Actually, uh, in this user-centric approach, we want to really take in uh, users' input or users' knowledge into uh, the data analysis process so it does not appear as a black box to the uh, users. So um, one use case that is very much related to uh, this um, visual analytics topic is explainable, explainable AI. And um, so uh, basically, um, mo in most of the cases, uh, we use AI as a black box. Basically, the machine learning model takes the input and then produce some output um, to, uh, for example, in autonomous driving, uh, we take the video input uh, from the camera and then uh, the steering wheel will, will take the corresponding directions. And or uh, in medical diagnostics um, solutions, um, the AI usually take in an, an image and then uh, tell the doctor or the patient what kind of disease it is. But this kind of black, go black box approach is usually not much reliable or people do not really um, uh, want to use uh, the machine learning model as a black box. So um, with visual analytics, we can uh, present the explanation to the users actually, and uh, then the user can provide feedback to the model and continuously improve the model until the model becomes um, transparent or explainable for the users. So why this is important, as I explained, 
uh, we have these um, fairness issues because we want to know AI is making its decisions based on some meaningful features instead of um, other features like gender or um, which can make this uh, model unfair to certain populations. And also we want to make this model robust and uh, on the other hand, there is also this GT GDPR regulation, uh, which requires every decision made by uh, AI to be explainable to the humans. So the user has the right to assess the explanation to the uh, decision made um, by an algorithm. So uh, now let's go in on our deeper technical dive uh, to look at a recent research paper we have published um, at uh, ACM CKDD this year, and which is about uh, interpretable and uh, steerable uh, sequence learning. And that has application in many different uh, AI fields like text mining um, or medical diagnostics and so on. Recurrent neural networks have shown impressive performance in modeling sequence data. They have been successfully used in a lot of applications, sentiment analysis, machine translation, speech recognition, and so on. However, they are considered as black boxes since it is very difficult to explain their predictions. Without explainability, it could cause trust and ethics issues. How can I trust the predictions coming out of a black box? These problems will limit the applications of these deep learning models in various decision-making scenarios. For example, a data scientist has developed a sequence prediction model to predict the risks of future problems of a car based on its historical faults. However, the mechanics and repair shops may find it difficult to choose the right maintenance strategy with just prediction results. Sometimes he even suspects that the modeling is wrong. The need for explanation is pervasive in such decision-making processes. The predictive model serves as a smart analysis module rather than an automatic end-to-end -end solution. Our idea is to explain the predictions by providing similar examples. Such case-based reasoning strategy is commonly used in our daily life. For example, why classify a restaurant review, pizza is good but service is extremely slow, as negative? This is because it is similar to two prototypical negative sentences good food, but worse service, and service is really slow. We use sequence encoder R, which encodes the input sequence into a fixed length embedding vector H. The model learns K prototype vectors that are most representative in the embedding space. We compute these similarities between H and the prototype vectors. The similarity scores are used as a source for prediction. To ensure that the prototypes are readable, we project the prototype vectors to their closest training samples every few epics. To further improve interpretability, we've simplified the prototype sequences using a beam search based algorithm. To utilize expert knowledge, we design an interaction scheme which allows human users to incorporate their domain knowledge into the model. We build interpretable and steerable sequence models for vehicle fault prediction, sentiment analysis, protein classification, and heartbeat classification. You can get explanations to the accurate predictions on the fly. Um, yeah, I'm here. Um, I would like to thank our HR Monica for the very nice voiceover of the video. And uh, <laughs> so, um, if you have any questions about the paper, you can search it online. So there is a title um, below um, at the bottom of this slide. And uh, yeah, so uh, now let's move on to the next topic and uh, see how our Bosch is enabling a new area of mobility uh, with our uh, presenter, Sumi, here. Hello, also from my side, I guess I'm the last turn. I hope you guys are still with me. Yes. That was a little bit too silent. Are you still with me? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> I know it's late. Um, my name is Honmi Choi, so please just call me Sunny. I'm Sunny from Sunnyvale, so it's easy to remember. And uh, I'm responsible for business development strategy within a newly established group. We are probably the youngest group within Bosch. We are eight months old, so we were born beginning of this year. And we are probably also the smallest group. 
and we're called Progressive Mobility Players, short PMP. Um, I will tell a little bit more about it later, but basically what we do is focus on new mobility startups because we see the mobility world is changing a lot. A lot of new players are entering the market and we are focused on two players, which are new electric vehicle manufacturers and at the same time also on mobility service providers. Today we've heard a lot about innovative, amazing technologies, learning about sensors, learning about battery management solutions, artificial intelligence and human-machine collaboration. I mean, I've been with Bosch seven years, but I didn't know that we had so much capability in-house. I just moved here beginning of this year, so it's amazing to see how much um, capabilities we have. And I would like to bring in a little bit of a different perspective, basically bring in a little bit the market perspective, customer needs, to explain and verify why these capabilities are so important for Bosch and also for the future of mobility. So before I start, I would like to give a little bit of a bigger picture of why the mobility is changing and what are the driving forces behind. Our world is changing, and this change is visible across the globe. More than 50% of our population now lives in cities. These cities are growing, as is the share of older people in them, while space to live is becoming ever more precious. More and more goods and people need to be transported, pushing the traffic infrastructure to its limits and increasing pollution and noise levels. But the world is waking up. Regulations are calling for stricter limits and cleaner solutions. A transformation has started, powered by new technologies and services. In a world where everything is connected, mobility is being reimagined. Solutions like traffic management, combined with cleaner and more efficient powertrains and the benefits brought by automated driving will make our city sustainable and livable. Bosch is driving this change and shaping the future. The future of mobility. Probably the new future of mobility, the trends, they are not new for you. But it's still very important to understand the fundamental driving forces behind it because this actually has a really big impact on Bosch because as we learned from UMA, the mobility part makes 60% of our revenue and all of these changes make a huge change or impact also on our business model if we want to maintain sustainable for the future. So air pollution, congestion, urbanization, and also we see a change in consumer behavior. All of these factors are really shaping a new focus for us in the mobility area, which we call electrified, automated, connected, and also shared and personalized, which you probably experience and also live every day. At the same time, mobility is also getting more user-centric. The consumer is more and more changing from owned to shared. So how many of you are using ride-hailing apps to get from A to B on a regular basis? So I see, not everyone, but a lot, I see a lot of hands raised. So this has become an integral part of how we move from A to B because it brings convenience, especially in congested cities. Also, consumers become more individual and personalized. And more importantly, they always want to stay connected. And this all relates to mobility and new players, startups, see this change and these trends as basically opportunities to come into the mobility market because now new capabilities are required and this disrupts the whole mobility value chain also from our Bosch perspective. So what does it mean for us? We also need to understand what these new players um, are about to um, develop, what is their thinking, how do they approach innovation. And that's why, as mentioned in the beginning, we are focusing on new EV-based customers. So probably a lot of you know Tesla in this area. 
So really uh, young companies who are starting vehicles from scratch or uh, the second customer segment is mobility service based customers. So all companies who provide mobility as a service, the ride hailing apps, car sharing and so on. What we see is that they have quite of a different DNA, they have different requirements, and that means also for Bosch, we need to understand the requirements and adjust also the way how we approach customers, because these young customers, they act differently, they drive innovation differently than the VW or Mercedes Daimler that we've been dealing with for the past 100 years. So it's time to change, and it has also a big transformational impact on us. So we see in the shared space, for example, the one customer segment we're focusing on, a huge change. If you look at the annual number of ride-hailing rides, you see a tremendous growth over the past four years. It's been grown more than 60%. From a user perspective, you also see a good reason why they're switching from ownership to shared. One of the reasons is because 96% of, of the time, your asset stands idle. The car is parked, you're at work, it stands idle for eight, nine, 10 hours while you sleep also. This, this is a waste of, of assets. So people are looking for alternative modes to move, alternative modes how to utilize their assets in a most more efficient way. So also this is one indication for why people are moving towards shared. Last but not least from an investor perspective, if you look at how much investments have flown into this area over the past four years only, more than 80 billion US dollar have, have been invested into the ride hailing market. This is humongous, this is likely to grow further, so this shared mobility will happen. So how do these uh, new customers tick and what are their pain points, what are the requirements? These are just some of the requirements or pain points that we identify when speaking to the customer. So operational costs for these ride-hailing companies is a huge thing. How can we become profitable? How can I optimize my operations? Second point is how can I ensure safety and security for the, for the passengers? Especially when we go towards robo-taxis, it will not have a driver anymore being able to control the ride. So we need technology to basically operate and also ensure the, ensure the safety even without a driver. Third is, there are so many players, players arising, I need to differentiate. If I want to survive in this market, I need to have a good differentiation point. So personalization, how to ensure that your ride is individual and a really great experience is one important differentiator that we have identified. For all these pain points, for all these requirements that we see, it kind of makes sense where we bring now the puzzle pieces together of the capabilities that we've seen from sensors which connect the cars, can connect the car and the user and a lot of other use cases that we've learned today. Battery management solutions is super important because we see a strong push towards electrification pushed by the government. Also, end users looking for environment friendly solutions. And also a lot of these right handling companies tend to establish their own EV fleets. So range anxiety and, and also improving the battery lifetime, what we learned today, are super, super crucial for the customers and the market. Autonomous driving was something that was mentioned. So a lot of these companies are also going towards robo-taxis. So artificial intelligence is also human-machine collaboration to really ensure that there is a safe and also unique experience between the human and the machine will be very relevant. And when we look at the customer and the market and the customers, we see that these um, capabilities will be important for the future to come. So I'm very proud to see that we are working on these very future-oriented topics. And um, this is the way how we would like to tackle the new era of mobility. So basically, in summary, with these capabilities, enable the vision of our mobility customers, not only the new ones, of course, also the existing customer base. Second, we want to innovate and co-create with these customers together. Because even though we have the best technology, there might be requirements that we may not have seen. So we need the customer input to even more improve the technology and also the use case. 
And last but not least, important point is really to understand and translate what the customers tell to us into technology. And that's why um, it's a good collaboration to have technology and also sales and the market proximity close to each other so that there is always an interlinkage and the bridge between technology and also market need. So we've talked a lot about AI, about new customers, about innovation, but I think it's also important to really close with the core, with the tradition, to not forget about the core business and also the roots where this company is uh, found on. So two values from Robert Bosch, the founder since 1886, have been that I have, he says, I have always acted according to the principle that I would rather lose money than trust. So the trust to the customers, to the market, providing safety is one really crucial element. Second point for doing business also with our customers is integrity. Integrity of the promises we make to our customers in regards to quality and also in terms of the promises that we make to them. And this to the founder and the values still hold to date are priori prioritizing this versus just having a short-term transitory um, profit. So I would like to remind us, all of us, when we speak about future topics, to think about the core values as well, because these are important. And this is how I would like to close the presentation. Thank you very much for the one hour attention. So you have been an amazing crowd. And I went a little bit over time. So thanks a lot for your patience. Um, I think we had great presentations here today. Um, I would like to thank all of you on behalf of the whole team for coming to our Sunnyvale side, for showing interest in our portfolio, in, in our technologies. And we would be happy to see you again, also to mingle and network after and to see if we have some collaboration opportunities. And last but not least, of course, I would like to thank all the staff, the presenters and all the people who've helped to support making this event happen. It was a lot of work. So let's have a nice evening and please don't leave too quickly. Thank you very much.